Thanks very much, Fred. Thanks. Thank you uh, for having me here. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the work that we're doing at NERSC, both in, in terms of trying to come up with energy solutions using computing. I'm at the middle of my talk. This is, oh, maybe I can go backwards. <laughs> there we go. All right, so I'm going to talk, uh, but especially about um, some of the issues of going to extreme scale computing, which is one of the things that we're focused on providing large scale computing and the energy efficiency things that we're working on um, for extreme scales. So to give you the take home messages up front, um, computing is an essential part of coming up with energy technology and understanding the impacts of energy solutions. Um, centralized facilities, so this is really what, what Rich was talking about in terms of, of um, cloud computing, give you improvements in efficiency, you get rid of that, um, that IET organization, hopefully leverage um, a group of people that are running a much larger facility. Um, large, there are large improvements possible in terms of improving the energy efficiency by redesigning computers and also some benefits um, that are possible from improving the energy efficiency of the facilities. Uh, to give you a little bit of a picture of what NERSC is about, we are the primary computing facility for the Office of Science and the Department of Energy. Uh, here are some of the cover stories based on the science results that have been simulated at NERSC. We have over 3,000 users. We have, um, they're organized into projects. The, the, what, what that means is that when you write, you write a proposal to the Department of Energy in order to get time in NERSC and you're allocated a number of hours as opposed to being allocated money, you, you get time instead. So each one of those is, has a PI on it and is a, is a grant of time. Um, about 500 different codes and across supercomputing centers of a kind similar to NERSC, um, that l number of application codes is very large and it makes it a very complicated facility to run. And for the vendors that we buy our computers from, it's a, very, uh, it's a fairly challenging environment in which to place a computer because every one of those codes can cause the computer to fail in unique ways. Um, our, our, uni our users are from universities, national laboratories, industry, um, and all the research here is open and unclassified. So we do not have some of the same kind of protection problems in terms of uh, that, that come up with that uh, kind of motivated virtualization and cloud computing. Certainly, scientists can be a paranoid and competitive group of people, but they tend to not be kind of as worried about it as um, as industry is. And um, so, it's about 1,600 publications were produced by the simulations at NERSC. It shouldn't surprise you, since it's a Department of Energy facility, that a lot of the research that goes on at NERSC is actually about energy. Um, so this shows just some of the pictures that have come out of some of the simulations. I could show you another 300 of, of these based on all the different projects. But just to give you an idea, um, there's research going on, on designing um, combustion devices using um, a novel algorithms, fusion simulation, looking for alternative energy sources, including fusion and biofuels. Um, looking at energy efficient devices um, l such as new elec elec electronics devices using nanotechnology, um, energy storage, so catalysis um, is one of the, the um, techniques that people are, uh, areas that people are working on. Uh, material science for a lot of different applications, one of which is solar panel uh, materials. Carbon capture and sequestration, so if you can't sort of solve the energy problem by coming up with alternative renewable sources, it's trying to figure out how to reduce the impacts of it through, through capture and sequestration of carbon. And then, of course, really trying to understand all the climate, the, the impacts of energy use on climate. And climate modeling has been a, a large source of computing at, at NERSC and other computing centers for a number of years. And in some sense, I think everything we know about cloud, about um, Climate um, change really comes from computing. It's not just looking at the, the um, annual weather reports and saying that it's warmer than it was over the past um, 20 years. It's actually saying that, that there's, there's a model here that, that show, explains why things have changed. So just a couple of examples in a little bit more detail. This is, a, I think, a, one of the uh, really great projects at NERSC, which is run by Gil Campo from the University of Colorado. Um, one of the problems with climate modeling is understanding, um, is trying to prove that those climate models are actually giving you the right answer. So it's a hot topic in the, um, over the last year in the press in terms of exactly how, how valid are these climate models. And so what Gil Campo is doing, since you can't really, you don't have any experimental data in the future in order to compare your climate models to, he's reconstructing climate data from the past and then running, running the climate models forward to see whether they predict the uh, major um, events in the climate that we actually do know happened in different periods of time. So unfortunately, the data, if you go back to 1871, which is when he started um, producing these data sets, is very sparse. So you look at these little red dots in there, those are points where there's actually weather data. So he runs an algorithm in order to smooth it out and kind of try to um, estimate what all of the values are in between here so you have enough data points that you can actually run a, a simulation forward. 
And um, once he does that, he's actually been able to do things like reproduce the Knickerbocker storm, which is a big w winter storm in, in um, 1922, the Dust Bowls in the 1930s, and an El the El Nino in 1918. So this really gives us some confidence that not only does he have reasonable data, but also that the climate models that people are using are predicting something real. Another example, um, which is a, an interesting combination of experimentation and simulation, is a project led by John Bell from Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Um, this is looking at simulation of low swirl burners, um, which were discovered at Lawrence Berkeley Lab um, in 1991. Here's a picture of, of um, somebody standing next to a, one of the larger burners um, and someone showing how, how cool it is that he's got his hands on that, that burner. And so um, what they're working on is simulating also fuel flexible burners um, that could, could burn things like um, hydrogen rich fuels um, and with near zero gas emissions. So how do we do these simulations? Well, we have a number of computer systems on the floor. I won't try to read to you all of the, the things that we have, but we've got a couple of very large Cray systems. The, the, the largest one right now is a system called Franklin. It has about, um, about uh, 10,000 nodes, that com uh, compute processors in it, or chips. Um, each of it is a quad-core processor, so about 40,000 uh, processor cores. Those are AMD processors. And another one is um, a Cray that we're in the middle of installing. Um, when, it's, when the installation is completed, it'll have about 150,000 cores. Um, there's some smaller clusters, including a cloud computing test bed, which I'll say a little bit more about. Um, we are running uh, eucalyptus experiments on it, um, among other things. Um, and then we have, some, uh, we have a large global file system and a tape archive for storing all of the scientific data, including all of that climate data. So from an energy standpoint, um, one of the things that you, um, that you might want to know is how much, the, how much energy is being used to produce the, those kinds of energy results. Um, so how much do you have to spend in order to, to figure out how to, how to um, solve the world's energy problems? Well, um, Franklin is about a 350 teraflop um, per, uh, peak machine, so th 350 um, trillion floating point operations per second. Um, and it consumes about 2.2 megawatts. Um, Hopper, the system that's coming in, is going to be about a, a one petaflop peak system, and so about three times larger, and will consume about three megawatts. So the, certainly the, the machines are getting more energy efficient in between those two, but the um, energy costs that we're, we're, we're paying for every year, the electrical costs are going up because the systems are becoming, um, the, the amount of, of computing hardware um, that you can buy for a fixed amount of money um, is going up in terms of the amount of energy that's required to run it. And everything else in the center is about, is a little under a megawatt. Um, so what is the, so, so I just wanted to give you that kind of picture of what NERSC is so you can understand why um, we have some big concerns about energy. We're already spending, um, as you can see, a, a few million dollars on our um, electrical bills every year. Um, and so the first thing I want to talk about is the, the idea, a little bit more about this idea of energy efficiency through centralization. So we run very efficiently in the following sense. Um, our computers are running 24 by 7 and ha have jobs running on those processors almost all of the time. So this is a much higher efficiency level than most of the, e even the big data centers like Amazon and Google will run at. Um, and the reason is because our scientists are forced to wait for their jobs to run. Okay, so they, their jobs sit in queues. They do not get that kind of immediate response time that you supposedly are going to get in the cloud. You don't always get that either in the cloud, but you don't, um, we, we don't provide kind of an elastic service that says just keep submitting your jobs and you can get, um, you can get the answer back immediately. So this shows you the availability and the utilization of our systems, a typical utilization. This is a system that was being put into, um, it was being, uh, put into production when we did an upgrade on it, um, but they typically run at about 90, 90 to 95% utilization. So what that says is there, there are a lot of people working on techniques for making the computer systems more energy efficient, for example, by turning down the clock speeds or um, uh, other things that would turn things, turn things off. It doesn't make a lot of sense in our environment to turn off complete compute nodes because they're almost always doing actual computation. Um, so the other important thing to remember, and I think Rich made a comment about this as well, is that science is not really a fixed size problem. So unlike a lot of IT requirements in various companies where they say this is the, pr the size of our problem in order to, to support the kind of work that we need to do, in the, the computational work that we need to do in this company, scientists will always come up with something else that they could do if you give them more computing time. So for the scientific computing centers, it's not clear what the right metric is for measuring the efficiency, but I think that we should be measuring something like science per megawatt or science per watt. 
So we don't really have a good way of measuring science per watt. So um, all of us who've gone through the tenure process know that counting publications is a pretty bad way of measuring science productivity. But nevertheless, we can kind of try to do that. NERSC has, um, runs at about 450 publications per megawatt year. Um, that, that, by the way, is actually a very, very high number. Because we have such a large number of users that produce those 1,600 publications, other centers of a similar size may have tens to hundreds of publications per year. So these are, this is a very efficient center from that standpoint. Um, so relative to others, we're doing very well. This efficiency is going to decline over time, because we, as we add more, as our, our computer systems are probably going to consume more power in the future, and I'll talk more about that later, the number of publications is going up, but not going up um, at the same rate that I think the energy usage is going to go up. So um, we are exploring cloud computing. Um, why are we looking at cloud computing? The first question is, well, gee, isn't that Franklin system that you have just a big cloud anyway? Um, I, you know, how is it different than a cloud? And I think when we talk to the scientists about it, there's really two or three things that come up. So one, one of the things is, well, access to Franklin is free, right? And um, when I go and access time in Amazon, I actually have to give them a credit card number. So, um, so that's one of the differences, which is actually not all that significant, because in both cases, what the researcher is doing is they're writing a proposal to get funding. In one case, the funding comes in the form of cash, and they send that, that cash to Amazon in order to get their computing time. In another case, they get an allocation of hours. So in both cases, they're, they're, they've got a limited resource that they get allocated um, that they have to spend. The two things that are most, the most important differences, I think, are this issue of scheduling and kind of the, the, the time um, to get an answer back from the cloud. And that's one of the reasons that people are interested in cloud computing. And the second one is because they want to run a particular version of the software. And when we run one of these supercomputers, we say, we're running this version of the operating system. You just have to live with it. So virtualization really helps um, address that problem in cloud computing. So we're building a cloud test bed. And it's really not trying to, look to, to compete with the supercomputers. What it's really trying to do is address the fact that there are still, in spite of the fact that we have you know, almost 200,000 cores that are going to be sitting there um, in NERSC, we still have a bunch of people going out and buying their own clusters be, be, for these other reasons. So the question is, can we provide them a service that would give them what they want in order to, um, to, get, a, uh, to get something that looks like a private virtual cloud um, in, a, in a, a centralized um, place such as NERSC? So we installed that earlier this year. It's an IBM iDataplex cluster. Um, and we're looking at a number of these different research, research questions on Magellan. So we do things um, within NERSC to try to make it um, very energy efficient. We're in a facility called the Oakland Scientific Facility. It's actually not on the Berkeley lab, main Berkeley Lab campus. It's in downtown Oakland, in part, mostly because we outgrew the power footprint of the facility that was um, on the hill at Berkeley Lab. And um, we use, in this, this cloud computing test bed that we installed, it uses um, liquid cooling on these um, rear door heat exchangers and the, the I, IBM iDataplex model. We actually modified the CDU um, design in order to um, pack the cabinets more tightly together. And, and, and it turns out that the system as installed is actually a cooling device on the floor because we're taking water from another computing system and feeding it into the, um, air in, the, the water intake. And um, the air coming out is actually cooler also than the air coming in. So we're kind of reusing both um, the water and air. OK, so what about um, computing? How do we redesign computers to make them more energy efficient? Um, this shows the kind of nominal growth in terms of computing performance that we would like to have at NERSC. Um, and it's based on historical patterns. That is, we get about a factor of 10 increase in peak performance of these systems um, every three to four years. Now, um, that what this target out here at the end is an exaflop um, computer system. So that's a, a thousand times faster than this hopper system that we're in the middle of installing right now. Um, and we're, we're, then the target is to have that in about, um, in about 10 years. Um, now, the, the hopper system, as I mentioned before, is three megawatts. If we tried to build an exaflop system today out of the same technology, that would be three gigawatts. So we're clearly not going to build a thing like that. Um, I was involved in a DARPA study group that looked at um, how the energy efficiency of computing technology is likely to scale over the next 10 years. And this red curve shows you that kind of usual scaling number, which would get us to a 200 megawatt system. So still not really practical. That's $200 million out of my $50 million a year budget. Um, so I can't afford um, to have a system like that on the floor. So the target is to have a 20 megawatt system. And this is a, a target that both DARPA and DOE are, think that is at least a, a reasonable target to shoot for. So how do we get another factor of 10 in terms of energy efficiency? Um, and the, uh, the, the, 
the important thing to know is that um, there's been a big shift in the computing industry in recent years because, um, because of the fact that we're, we can no longer make the clock speeds any faster. And we can't make them any faster because, um, because of the heat density and the processors. And so what you see over here is transistor density. That's Moore's law, which is continuing to go up as it has historically, doubling every 18 to 24 months. Um, but the, the speed of the processors is actually turned over. Um, and instead, what we're getting here is we're getting a, a doubling of the number of cores on a processor. So this is helping us to keep the processors within somewhat a, a reasonable power density level, but our energy use overall in the system is still much too high. Um, if we, that, that would give you kind of that traditional scaling curve if we just sit and wait for these number of cores um, to double every, every few years. So um, what we're looking at is trying to use much smaller, lighter weight cores, which are much more energy efficient. So who are people that understand how to design energy efficient computers? They're people that design things like cell phones and other embedded devices, iPods and so on, because they are limited by battery life. And so the designers of those things really use techniques that are designed primarily for energy efficiency. And this picture shows you kind of graphically both from an area standpoint, but also from a power standpoint. Um, on the next slide, I guess, gives you the power numbers that um, if you look at a, a server processor, like a Power 5 processor, um, compare that to a laptop processor or a, uh, there's an Intel Atom processor or the Tensilica processor, which is an adult, uh, a, a cell phone processor, um, you see a huge improvement in the energy efficiency of those different processors, in addition to a huge improvement in the size of the, the processor cores. So you can actually put a large number of those, core, of those little tiny cores on a chip and get something that is, has much higher performance. The catch is that you have to rewrite all your software now to take advantage of these very fine-grained, um, lightweight processing cores. Um, this was a study done by a green, the Green Flash Project at um, Berkeley Lab, led by John Schauf, looking at whether you could build a computer that would actually be sufficiently powerful to do climate modeling um, using these kinds of embedded processor cores. And so they looked at three technologies. This was done in 2008, so it's kind of 2008 technology. Um, and what you see here are the differences in trying to build three different systems. Um, and this is just a back of the envelope calculation, the amount of power required um, to run it with an AMD processor, a blue gene P processor, which is a, an embedded processor core, kind of the kind of thing you might find in a laptop, um, versus a uh, green flash uh, processor, which is based on this Tensilica, very low power technology. And you can see that you get almost um, a couple of order ma orders of magnitude improvement in the power of that system. So the last thing I want to talk about is the fact that um, the energy efficiency of the computers is one thing, but there is still some benefit by having very energy efficient facilities. Um, and uh, other researchers at Lawrence Berkeley Labs, so this is led by Dale Sartor, has done a study of um, 30 data centers, and I think some of you have already seen some of this data. They found a very wide variation in the performance of those data centers in terms of how energy efficient they were from a PUE standpoint, which we heard about this morning. Um, this is the graph that shows you that this is actually the, um, the inverse of PUE. This is the, called the, the DCIE score of them. So ju it's just one over the PUE. Um, and here's the average, which is around 57%. Um, higher is better. And um, we're over here on uh, one of these, most, uh, these um, very efficient lines there. The, uh, um, we're actually working on designing and building a new facility, which is going to be back on the Berkeley Lab Hill. This is right at the, the main entrance, um, the gate um, that you come up the hill towards Berkeley Lab if you've been there. Um, so this is a, a simulation, if you will, of that data center, um, and which will also have an, uh, about 300 offices for the people that run the facility, that is the nurse people that work for me, and also the, the researchers that do computer science and, and applied math research. So one of the things that we're taking advantage of in the design of this facility is the Berkeley weather. It turns out that Berkeley, although people think of Berkeley as being relatively warm relative to places like um, Chicago and uh, New York, um, it's actually very cool um, on average, and we, we never have, we rarely have very hot temperatures. So you can actually use outside air cooling um, for about over 90% of the days um, that the center is in operation. So we're actually planning to do that. We have um, the design actually has a, a large air intake um, area, which is um, where there's fans that are that are um, bringing the air in and um, a fairly interesting combination. Um, because we are a 24 by 7 facility, we will still have coolers in there and you can actually combine these in various ways in order to keep the, uh, to do the, the cooling that's required to run the computing facility but use um, as much outside air as possible. Um, our predicted 
performance of the facility would be a, a DCIE score of about um, 0.95 if you average it over the year. Um, on those kind of worst hot days, it would be about 0.88. So a big improvement relative to kind of the, the average um, typical scores that you see today. So just to summarize, I think um, you know, computing is really essential to coming up with some of these energy solutions, new sources of energy, generation of energy, um, storage, mitigation of um, various energy sources and the impacts of them. And um, secondly, that we, we really need to, I think, be very careful about how we measure and talk about energy efficiency. It's all very well and good to say we want to make this particular computing technology more energy efficient, but it really doesn't make sense, for example, for us to um, turn down the processors when um, it would actually be better just to have more people using um, the resources that are running rather and, and not having um, separate computer systems in another place. Energy is a huge problem for high-end computing centers like NERSC. Um, power density is a problem across the scales, but at the high end, um, this issue of the cost of energy is really becoming uh, a real design constraint for the next generation of machines when we're looking at another factor of 1,000 improvement in performance. So we're going to have to go to a completely new way of building these systems, I think, and leverage it in a different part of the, of the commodity market. And finally, that um, you know, there are, I think there still are opportunities for improvements in, um, in innovations in computing facilities, and we're hoping that um, we will get to explore some of these in the, in the CRT facility. So with that, I will stop and see if there are questions. This is a nice talk, Casey. Um, when, you, when you plan to use this low, uh, simple processor, do you view like you have many small processors, you still can sustain the same utilization that you see today at the uh, Berkeley lab? What, does, what are software challenges to make them fully utilized in terms of every core fully utilized in, in right, the next so five to 10 years? I think that the biggest challenge to keeping the system fully utilized, and that, that's a part of energy effic or efficiency in general of the computing systems that we worry about a lot, which is you can, you can put a system on the floor that has a very high performance and even a very high efficiency in terms of peak megaflops or gigaflops per watt or petaflops per watt, um, but actually isn't very effective at providing cycles to real scientific applications and the algorithms that are inside of them. And so we really actually, whenever we do evaluation of our systems, we look at application performance per megawatt as opposed to peak performance per megawatt. It's a more complicated story, so I use the peak numbers here. Um, I think the biggest factor in terms of making them effective is going to be memory bandwidth. Um, and, and perhaps my memory capacity, but um, you have to be able to feed the processor cores. If you're going to put a thousand processor cores on a chip, which is what we're looking at in the straw man designs for an exascale system, you have to be able to feed a, an enormous amount of data in there. And I think the current technology, both memory technology and that pin technology, is going to be uh, you know, a limitation right now. Hi there. Uh, I was curious if, you, if you've done any uh, comparisons between your data center and other data centers like either Amazon or Google's or any of the others are out there and how they compare. And I'd be curious from a cost perspective how they line up as well. Yeah, so um, it's an interesting question. We have, done, we, um, we have not done some comparisons on energy efficiency of those um, in part because I think we haven't, we don't really, it, it's hard to get some of that data out of um, the commercial data centers. We have looked at the performance and it's one of the things that we've done. We've compared the performance, for example, of the Franklin system to our own cloud test bed running eucalyptus, not running eucalyptus, um, and also then uh, compared it to Amazon. And what we do see is it depends a lot on the application. Um, for some applications, Franklin is quite a bit faster than Amazon and other applications, um, it, there's a genomics one, which is mostly independent computations. It doesn't make much difference. The biggest difference seems to be in the interconnect um, performance, and so that's, that's really where we see the differences. Um, we've also done some kind of cost analysis on that internally. Um, we found that when we present those numbers publicly, we end up in all kinds of trouble. So um, <laughs> I'm happy to talk to you about them privately, but uh, we, we, do, we no longer put them in our public presentations. It's, it's very hard to get kind of real cost data, right? We're kind of, it's, it's very, Kind of squishy.